Well, we are glad that you're here this morning, and uh, as we've opened up our children's ministry and three services and whatever comfort level uh, is yours, we just want to make an opportunity for you to join us uh, in person and online uh, as we uh, uh, launch into this series of Daniel. Go ahead and uh, find chapter one, either in your Bible or on your device. We're going to look at chapter one uh, this morning. Uh, Last weekend, uh, we had uh, had an awesome outdoor service. Uh, Thank you for participating in that. This past Wednesday, uh, we kicked off uh, Grace Students. Uh, I don't know if you uh, noticed in the parking lot, uh, they launched uh, 6,000 water balloons Wednesday night, which, uh, yeah, that was something. Uh, And uh, they tried to pick up all of the balloons off of the parking lot, but they couldn't get it all. It looked like a birthday cake threw up out there. But uh, they had a lot of fun, and uh, they're going to come back this Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, every Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, so bring uh, your teenagers uh, for that. I'm excited about this story of Daniel. I love the story of Daniel. How many of you grew up in Sunday school hearing the story of Daniel? Several of you. How many of you grew up with flannel graph? Okay, there's several of you. Uh, some of you are asking, what is flannel graph? I think that's so sad if you don't know what that is. Uh, that's where, you know, pe- uh, you know, the teacher, the Sunday school teacher would get a terry cloth, uh, like a towel or something, and then they would have paper figures with sticky stuff on the other side, and they would tell the story of Daniel by putting the figures uh, on, the, uh, on the terry cloth. And if you were a good student, if you listened to that story, sometimes the, the Sunday school teacher uh, would give you an opportunity. You got to tell the story uh, about Daniel and the lion's den, and then the teacher would wrap up and remind us, you know, boys and girls, you know, if you love God and you do everything right, then God will save you from everything uh, that's, that's bad. He will save you from trouble and nothing uh, will ever happen to you, uh, which is not quite the point uh, of the story because the story of Daniel is all about bad things happening to you. Friends, the point of Daniel's story is that God will always save you in trouble, but he will not always save you from trouble. He will always be faithful to you in trouble, but he will not always deliver you from trouble. Daniel's story is a story of trouble and how God, how Daniel is able to thrive, how God is able to use Daniel and be with Daniel in all of the trouble that he faces. In fact, he doesn't just survive this story, he actually thrives in this story. So that's the question we're asking in this series. How do you thrive in a difficult story? I want to begin with chapter 1, verse 1. Daniel 1, it says, In the third year of the reign Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, which is Babylon, to the house of his God, his pagan temple, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, his administrator, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths, uh, young men and women, without blemish of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's Palace. So here's, what, here's what's happening. Babylon, ancient Babylon is now modern day Iraq. Uh, just for your information, that won't be on the quiz. However, what might be on the quiz is, the, is, is what Babylon represents. You go all the way to the end of the Bible, the book of Revelation, where we find out how this story ends. And when evil is personified, when John is talking about the darkness, the, the darkness of Satan's domain... The kingdom of darkness and how it wars against the kingdom of light, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of Jesus. John calls that kingdom of darkness Babylon. Babylon the great. Babylon has fallen. There's a lot of times images in the Bible are symbolic both physically and spiritually. And most scholars believe that when John is referring to Babylon, that's euphemistic for the the Roman Empire, which was in John's day persecuting and killing Christians for their faith. And so John couldn't use the, the term Babylon or Roman. Uh, so he, he uses the term Babylon as the empire describing the evilness, the darkness of, of Satan's domain. Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon was the epitome of evil and brutality. Babylon was out to conquer. It was the chief uh, ruler of the day. It was out to conquer and subdue the entire civilized earth at that time, creating a one world government where everyone was subjected to the gods and to the, to the systems of Babylon. 
So history tells us that Nebuchadnezzar went to the far ends of the earth to Egypt at that time, conquered Egypt, subjected them to Babylon, and then on his way back to Iraq, well, there's this little country called Israel. He just steps into that, burns down the city, destroys the temple, and carries off anything of value back to Babylon, including people. And his strategy is quite genius. He's going to have to rule this entire empire. And so instead of killing his enemies and destroying you know, everything that they know, he, he takes all of the smart, strong, influential, top echelon people, young men full of potential, takes them back to Babylon. It goes on in verse 4 to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. Verse five, the king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. They were to present themselves to the king's palace, to the king's kingdom as men serving in the court of the king. Young men, probably teenagers, anywhere from 14, 15, maybe 17 years old in the prime of their youth. Think back to you when you were a teenager. For some of you, that's going to take some work. But think about, think about you as a teenager and all your hopes and dreams all the things that you thought your life could be about, would be about. And he takes all of those young people and he trains them for three years. He re-educates them in the culture of Babylon. He tells us, verse six, who these men were. Among them were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs, Ashpenaz, gave them names. He renamed them. Daniel, he called Belshazzar. Hananiah, he called Shadrach. Mishael, he called Meshach. And Azariah, he called Abednego. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember those names, Sunday school people? Okay, that was another terry cloth. That was another flannel graph story. Uh, and so Daniel and his three friends are carted off to Babylon and re-educated into the culture of Babylon. Last year in 2019, a study was taken and it showed us that 65% of adults in America identify as Christians. 65%, about two thirds of our culture identify as Christians. What's interesting about that is that number is 10% lower than it was just four years ago. Just four years ago, it has dropped 10%. Our culture is increasingly secular. It is becoming less and less uh, influenced by Christian culture. In fact, uh, our culture is becoming, um, we call them the nuns. Uh, that, That demographic is increasing. People who identify with no faith system. No faith. Indifference to faith is giving way to hostility toward faith. Those preaching tolerance are no longer tolerant of those who would disagree with them on cultural issues, the definition of marriage or gender, or disagree on moral authority or truth. And so we as followers of Jesus uh, are living in this post-truth, post-Christian culture. And first of all, we ask how that happened. How, how is this happening? Well, ask Nebuchadnezzar. He was a pro at transforming culture. Uh, and he does this uh, uh, by doing three things. And we've just read that in this passage. First, he changes identity. He gives these men new names. They get new names. Now, in our culture, names, uh, unless we're, you're naming your children after somebody that you know and love and honor, uh, most of our names are just picked out of a list that's popular at the time. Uh, in fact, the year that I was born, uh, the most popular boy name was Michael. And you know a lot of Michaels my age, because that was the popular name at the time. Uh, if you're giving birth to children this year, uh, 2020, the most popular name is Oliver. So we'll see how many Olivers there are uh, in our culture. But here's the thing. In ancient culture, names were, names were not just important. They were prophetic You read in the Old Testament how parents named their children. It was an intentional way of planting a vision in the life of that child, communicating to them what God's intention was for their life. And so the first thing that Nebuchadnezzar does is that he eradicates that identity and gives them a new name with a new purpose. Daniel, uh, his name meant God is my judge. And Nebuchadnezzar changed his name to Belshazzar, which means make Bel, a Babylonian deity, may Bel protect 
the king. This was very intentional on Nebuchadnezzar's part. Hananiah meant who is like God. Shadrach is who is like Aku, another uh, Babylonian deity, diametrically opposed uh, to Hananiah. Mishael, God is gracious. He has now given the name Meshach. Aku is exalted. Nebuchadnezzar is replacing the true, one true God in the life of Mishael with the God of Babylon. And then Azariah means God is my helper. And now he's named Abednego, which means servant of Nebo. Uh, their parents were intent on instilling within them the awareness of the one true God. And Nebuchadnezzar was just as intent to eradicate any such awareness. Implant within each of these men a new identity coinciding with a new worldview. It tells us that they were trained for three years in the literature and the language of the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. Friends, literature and language is simply culture, values, a worldview, how you see the world and operate in the world, how you understand the world. He was training them in the philosophical systems of the Babylonian empire and immersing them into the culture of that empire. He was giving them the very best that the kingdom had to offer, a place in the palace, a position in the king's court, and all the benefits, the food and the wine that came with that. This was, this was Nebuchadnezzar's way of dominating his captives and expanding his own kingdom. Don't just conquer them and subject them, but rather indoctrinate them and assimilate them so when you spread them back out over the empire, they are ruling, they are living in the ways of Babylon. Daniel is one of the best illustrations of in the world, but not of the world. A resident of Babylon whose home was in Israel, resisting the pull of the culture, intent on dismantling his faith. Now, friends, we've been talking about this for the last uh, several weeks, how our culture is changing and what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus in a world that does not follow Jesus? And that's our question. How do we, as Jesus followers, live in the kind of culture uh, that is not just indifferent to our faith, but in many ways adamantly opposed, even hostile, aggressively combative with our faith and people of faith? How do we not just survive this, but how do we thrive in this kind of context? And let me give you three kind of options throughout history that, that the church has chosen. There are some who have chosen to separate, to isolate from the culture, detach and disengage. We take the turtle posture. We bury our hands in the sand. We, we, deta- we separate ourselves, isolate ourselves from anything that the culture does or says. And we go off by ourselves and we watch our Christian movies and Uh, listen to our Christian music and eat our Christian chicken. And we just kind of take the stance that, you know, we don't bother you and you don't bother us. You leave us alone and we'll leave you alone. Well, number one, that doesn't seem to keep the world from persecuting us. (laughs) Uh, There have been factions in the Christian community that have taken this approach. They still get mistreated. But secondly, and more importantly, this just doesn't seem to line up with the great, uh, the great commandment and the great commission, which we are called, we are called to be salt and light, to engage and infiltrate our culture. Some of us take this, this separation route. Another uh, segment of the church takes the assimilation route. The assimilation, if you can't beat them, join them. And so we've seen this in history where we've adjusted our theology and our doctrine. We've reinterpreted scripture and redefined our values to make it more palatable to the culture that we're in, thinking that if we can just, you know, kind of minimize or, or compromise or dilute our, our values and our commitments, uh, then the world is going to like us more. Again, it doesn't make the world like us more. In fact, if you're just like the world, what do you have to offer the world? I mean, if, in our, if our attempt, is, if our strategy is to be relevant, then we actually become unnecessary. And so both of these options are powerless. What we see Daniel doing in this particular situation, in his story, a group of exiles carried off into Babylon is to neither isolate, separate, or to assimilate. It's to infiltrate to infiltrate. We looked at Jeremiah 29 a few weeks ago where God was telling these, these young men in Babylon to settle in, but don't settle down. Make a home that is not your home. Uh, you are called, whatever, whatever they call you, whatever they try to teach you, whatever they try to offer you, you are called to be God's distinctive in this culture. Daniel lived in Babylon his entire life. He lived as an exile for 70 years in a place that did not welcome him 
did not accept him. And what's interesting, if you read the book of Daniel, three different times, under three different kingdoms, he led three separate religious revivals, spiritual revivals, under this condition of exile. This, th- this series is entitled Thrive, okay? So this is not about how we survive the culture. This is how we thrive in the culture. How do you thrive in your Christian faith when that faith is misunderstood, when that faith is mistreated, when you're not accepted, when you're excluded? How do you thrive when everything in the culture seems to be working against everything that you believe and value? We find that answer in Daniel. Jesus said, blessed are you. In other words, you can thrive when people hate you and persecute you and mistreat you. How can you thrive when everyone is against you? We find that answer in Daniel. So I want us to, I want us to get a picture of Daniel's life in chapter 1. Get the context that Daniel is playing out in this passage. Think about this. Take a 16-year-old boy with all that he has going for him. He's of the nobility. He's up in that upper echelon with all of the opportunities. So with all of the dreams and all of the ambitions that a young man would have, and you rip him out of the only world that he has ever known. You separate him from his parents, his family, from everyone who has ever loved him. And you throw him into a pagan culture. You throw him into a foreign land, a God-hating world with a strange language and a strange custom In 70 years time, we read the book of Daniel and there's no mention of a wife. There's no mention of a family. Daniel spends his life working in the king's court, operating in the king's palace. It was quite common in ancient culture. In fact, we find the word twice in chapter one. It was quite common that any men working close to the king were castrated to humiliate them and to control them and to protect the king's harem from them. And for 70 years, for 70 years, Daniel lived in that kind of experience. He went to work in a place that did not value who he was or what he stood for. Friends, the reason, six uh, six chapters later, the reason why we find Daniel in the lion's den is because the people that he worked with hated him and wanted him gone. They lied about him. They, They plotted against him. Every day he went to work in a hostile environment. Friends, every day in Daniel's life was a lion's den. So how did he not give up and give in? How did he thrive in these kind of conditions? How did he not only hold to his own convictions, But how did he influence three different administrations with the knowledge of the one true God? Well, I believe chapter 1 kind of lays out the strategy that he took. In the very first chapter in verse 8, it said that Daniel resolved. Daniel resolved. I'll unpack that uh, in just a moment. But this this is the key, I believe, to understanding how Daniel thrived in his context. It was like Daniel said, you can change my address, you can change my name, you can change what I'm taught, you can change what I'm exposed to, you can offer me everything that you have, but I will not change who I am. I will not change what I'm called to be and to do. Now, question, does any of this resonate with you? Do you find yourself in a place, do you find yourself kind of out of place in, our, in, in your culture? Do you find yourself kind of out of step with what people are thinking and what people are doing, what people believe? Do you feel like maybe this this world is not your home? Well, Daniel was in the right place at the right time, and you are in the right place at the right time. Daniel was plunged into this new anti-God environment, and he had to decide. He He had to resolve. He had to embrace his calling. Let me give you three things that contributed to Daniel's thriving, not just surviving this experience, but thriving in this world. Here's the first thing he did. He had to think differently from his world. He had to think differently from his world. Everybody thinks about their world. Everybody has a view of their world. It's called a world view. And a world view is just simply a set of assumptions or beliefs uh, about, you know, questions about where we came from, 
where we're headed, what is this life all about, what is important in life, what is good and true. And all of us have kind of answers to these questions based on the influences that we've exposed ourselves to or the set of beliefs that we've embraced. Whether you realize it or not or whether you've actually articulated it or not, all of us have these, these foundational issues of existence and our answers to them and how it affects uh, our functioning in our culture. The things that you do, the decisions that you make, the values that you hold, all stem from your worldview or the way that you think. And Daniel had to resolve to think differently from his culture. For instance, if you believe... Uh, in a God who created the world as opposed to a belief that we just simply exist because of a random explosion of chemicals. You know, if you believe that there is a source from which we were created, if you believe that you were created in the image of God as opposed to a process where, you know, survival of the fittest you know, this evolutionary process where we're just animals with a conscience. Uh, If you believe that because of this, there is a set of moral absolutes by which life functions better if we adhere to them, or you believe that truth is whatever you make it and whatever works for you, do that. Friends, that's going to influence what you believe is true. That's going to influence what you believe is important. That's going to influence the values that you hold. That's going to influence the decisions that you make. That's going to influence the life that you live. Again, Daniel had to resolve to maintain his biblical worldview. He took to heart Jeremiah's directive to not escape the culture, but to influence the culture. Not to let the culture influence him. But thousands of years before Jesus coined the term salt and light, Daniel was the salt and light seeking the welfare of his culture by influencing the culture with his biblical worldview. Daniel resolved to think differently. Secondly, he resolved to choose boldly, to choose boldly. Daniel was given a new name. He couldn't refuse that. He was subjected to a Babylonian education. He couldn't refuse that. But when he was offered the Babylonian diet or when he was offered all of the uh, cultural benefits and and, uh, all of the luxuries of the cultural, the Babylonian lifestyle. I mean, friends, this was so much more than just a palace buffet where you could just do what, you know, eat. A couple of years ago, we did a series entitled Dinner with Jesus. Do you remember that series? We looked at all of the the different meals that Jesus had uh, with individuals. And this was very important because in Jesus' day... uh, much like it is today, friends, you, you, you eat with people you like, right? <laughs> Most of us eat with people that we like to associate with. Most of the time we eat with people who share at least a level of our own values, our own worldview. We think alike, we believe alike, we choose alike. And so the, the, the text doesn't really tell us why Daniel refused this food. It could have been sacrificed to idols, which would have been, you know, against his conscience. This food for sure wasn't kosher. And so that could have been an issue. It could have just been unhealthy. I mean, Daniel does use that argument. Or it could have been an exercise of adapting to a culture, which Daniel just simply refused not to do. In participating in the luxury of this culture, in the food and the wine, it was like Daniel saying, okay, I'm okay with this. I'm okay with this lifestyle. I'm okay with this culture. I'm okay with these values. And that was a line that Daniel just simply could not cross. Now, we all have lines we cannot cross. What's those lines for you? What's that line for you? There were things that Daniel could participate in, and then there were things Daniel just simply could not, to be true to his God, could not participate in. But there's more to it than this. I want to fast forward to chapter 6, verse 3, where we find this phrase, Daniel distinguished himself. Uh, Daniel distinguished himself. It goes on telling us, you know, this is not just about what Daniel refused to do. This is about what Daniel chose to do. Okay? How did Daniel distinguish himself? Well, we see this back in chapter 1 as well. 
But friends, we find in the story of Daniel that no one worked as hard as Daniel. No one was as faithful as Daniel. No one was as loyal to the king as Daniel. He didn't call off. He didn't, you know, come in late. He didn't steal office supplies. He did his job and he did it well. He did it better than anyone else. And it got him noticed. The king noticed this. All, the, all of the officials noticed this. And so, you know, back in chapter one, it tells us that there was no one like Daniel. He and his friends, verse 20, says that every, no one was better than Daniel in the king's court. Daniel distinguished himself in character and competence, character and competence. There were things that Daniel would not do, but what he could do, he was the best at doing. In fact, in chapter 6, this is what put him in the lion's den. His enemies hated his character and competence. They hated it that he was honest and true. They hated it that he worked so hard and was so loyal. But that's just the point, friends. Daniel resolved. Daniel resolved to stay true to himself. Whether I'm criticized or rejected, I'm going to stay true to my calling. I'm not going to whine about it or complain about it. I'm, going to, I'm not going to play the victim. But here's what I am going to do. I'm going to be the best employee this, this company has. I am going to be the best neighbor in my subdivision. I am going to be the most supportive and positive parent on the soccer field. Try that. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be a positive influence in our culture. Whatever I do, I'm going to do it in the name of my God. I'm going to do it for the glory of God. And I'm just going to let the chips fall where they may. And so just for a moment, I, can, can we just sink into this? Can we just, you know, think about this for a moment? Think about your impact and your influence on the world around you. Sometimes we get tired of trying to, you know, maintain faith in a culture that's so anti-faith. And sometimes we, we, we slip into this victim mentality, this woe is me, poor me, because I'm trying to stand up for Jesus and everything is against me. But think about your calling. Think about where God has you. And let's just put this in a practical sense. Are you the, are you the lazy guy at work? <laughs> are you the one that claims to be a Christian, but you're the angry one on Facebook? Are you the gossip and the complainer? Are you the negative one? Are you the cynical and the critical one? Are you distinct? How are you distinguishing yourself in a culture that is anti-Jesus? Are you demonstrating the life of Jesus in a way that attracts people to Jesus, when people think of you, when they cross paths with you, when they have to deal with you, what's the impression you leave with them? Daniel had to choose boldly to live out his faith. And here's the third thing Daniel did. He resolved to live hopefully. Daniel was not a whiner. Daniel did not play the victim. Daniel did not isolate and separate See, I can, I can just go back again to his early days, this 16-year-old kid, this teenager all alone. How terrified he must have been. How tormented in a world. Not, not, this was not his fault. This was not his, of his making. He, he deserved none of this. And yet here he is. Uh, for many of you, uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 is your Favorite verse, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. But I want you to think about this, friends. These words, these words were written directly to Daniel. This was the very first audience of this letter that God wrote to the mouth of Jeremiah. Daniel was the first to receive these words. This teenager who was kidnapped and ripped out of his home, away from his family, castrated and subjected to the most evil empire on the planet. And Jeremiah says to Daniel, 70 years, Daniel, 70 years. Now, most of us can survive something difficult if we know there's an end in sight, if we know that it's just temporary. But 70 years, <laughs> Jeremiah is telling Daniel, you have 70 years. Not to isolate or separate. You have, you have 70 years to play your part. You have 70 years for God to use you to make himself known. And friends, I believe this was the hope and the promise that gave Daniel courage and credibility and optimism and perspective and hope, knowing that God is in control, knowing that history has a destination and knowing that he has a place in this story that he has a part to play 
in this history? How are you gonna impact the world around you and change the course of history? How are you gonna settle in but don't settle down? You're gonna, you're gonna live out your values and you're gonna do your job. You're gonna stay faithful to God and you're gonna live out your calling because a day is coming when God will make all things new and he will make all things right. Friends, this is our hope. God is writing a story that has a happy ending and you are a part of it. You are a part of it. So don't just survive, thrive. Embrace your calling and live out your purpose and watch what God does in this story. Would you pray with me? Father, I don't know where uh, most of us are in this room when it comes to living out our faith, operating in a world that does not value our values or appreciate or respect our convictions, that sometimes intentionally mistreat us because of what we hold to. But Father, may we never take the route of separation and assimilation, but that we would embrace the calling that you've given us to be salt and light, to infiltrate and to influence the world around us, be it our neighborhood, be it our workplace, be it the soccer field or the football field or wherever you plant us, Father. May we be that influence that disseminates and communicates to the world around us that you are God and that you love us. To that end, we pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.